whole town ceased all cooperation. More than a hundred thousand went to jail. Millions of peasants made salt. Teachers and students made salt and went to jail. There was no Congress session. All the leaders were in jail. By January 25th, 1931, Lord Irwin announced an end. The people in the streets celebrated. Irwin had announced unconditional release of the leaders. Gandhi was free. Members of the working committee were free. And the crowds heard that Gandhi had conferred with the Viceroy and offered tea. He put a pinch of salt in it to remind us of the famous Boston Tea Party, he said. Victory was theirs. Gandhi's truth did have force. The terms of agreement were announced. Civil disobedience to cease. People on the sea coast could pick up and manufacture salt. Gandhi's experiment with the use of human energy of truth force, as he had called it, had shown results. The means had been good, said Gandhi. The ends would be good. His promise had been fulfilled. Gandhi spoke to them, and Nehru sat at Gandhi's feet as he spoke. All ordinances were withdrawn. India to confer at London in a round table conference. Such was the victory. And the love of the people flowed out to Gandhi in demonstrations such as this world had seldom seen. He had given them peace, but most, he had given them back their self-respect. But for this victory, lives had been given. On February 6th, the released Motilal Nehru died. At the Karachi Congress, Gandhi was selected as the sole Congress representative to go to the London Round Table Conference. And the leader of India prepared for a return to the West. He sailed from Bombay August 29th, saying, I promise I will not disappoint your trust in me. He was going back to the West for the first time since World War I. He had a deep affection for it. Once asked if he had a message for America, he said, yes, give them my love. Did he have any other message? And follower, as always, his needs for happiness were simple. He loved children was capable of a child's simplicity, laughter. And Gandhi and his party finally arrived at Marseille. Gandhi with his indestructible vitality, playing jokes. Secret service men had been sent to guard him. He called them his family. With him his party, David Os Gandhi, Miss Slade, his secretaries, Mrs. Naidu. On the boat going to London, he still had on only his loincloth and shawl. You wear plus fours, he told a reporter laughingly. Millions in India could afford no more. He arrived in England. And as always on this European trip, there were crowds to see him. Gandhi was delighted to see anyone who came. He talked with everyone. East was not East, and West was not West. A man, he felt, should not glory in the fact that he loved his country, but that he loved his kind. He stayed at Kingsley Hall, in the heart of the poor district, where he could talk personally with the people who crowded to talk to him. Bernard Shaw was to see him, and said, you are Mahatma Major, and I am Mahatma Mind. Indians paraded for him, even in the rain. He went to Lancashire, was met by dignitaries. It had been feared he might be attacked, because his home spinning movement had taken work from the Lancaster mills. He went. He wanted to see all he could with his own eyes. At 62, walking everywhere. Standing in the street, he spoke, I have not tried to harm you. You have three million unemployed, he said, but we have 300 million unemployed half the year. And they cheered him. And now people waited to see him pass. 
He lifted their hearts, they said. He attended round table conferences. There were 112 delegates, 20 from the British government, 23 from princely India, 64 British India, mostly Viceroy appointed. And Gandhi saw separate groups being set up, emphasizing differences in India rather than a common cause. There was talk of separate electorates, English in India to vote for English legislators in India. Muslim only for Muslim representatives. As America could have been divided state by state at the time of the revolution, India was in danger of being split into such groups as Hindus, untouchables, Parsis, and so on. Gandhi felt unity was essential. That India should remain one in common humanity not many divided by ancient hatreds. He found Sir Samuel Hoare, next Secretary of State for India, an honest and frank-hearted Englishman. But he could not accept the results of this conference. As he left, he said, even though I may have to go in an exactly opposite direction, you are still entitled to a vote of thanks from the bottom of my heart. In Paris, a crowd packed a French theater to hear him. Everywhere, people reached out to see and touch a man who thought truth and love stronger than hate and violence. He went to Switzerland. Invitations had come from America, France, Germany, Italy, Palestine, Egypt, Hungary, Denmark, Ireland. He would gladly have gone everywhere, talk with everyone, but he had little time. He came now to stay with a great writer on great men. The writer was Roman Roland, who said of him, he is simple as a child. A man of purest sincerity. He's completely modest about himself, never hides his mistakes, never makes compromises, hates public adulation of himself. He is at peace in silent meditation with his God. Behold the man. He spoke in Geneva. Up till now, I used to say, God is truth. Now I believe truth is God. Then to Italy, and in a country dominated by Mussolini, they too crowded to see a man who said that truth and love were more powerful than violence. And like all others in the West, they found him amazingly vital kindly, full of genuine affection, common sense, with an intense belief in what he said and with a sense of humor. 